Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm Jimmy Su. I'm the woman's officer in Greenwich and Luichin CLP. Uh, locally, I provide a training to women in the party to encourage them to be active in the party, to stand for office roles, etc. And this year, we have put a uh, five women delegation to the London Region Office. So we totally only have five delegates vacancies, and all of them are women this time. So at the women's office, I'm really proud of it. Uh, I'm a feminist because I'm proud of being a woman. I love being a woman. I really enjoy womanhood. I think the reason is because um, I grew up with my brother who was uh, two years older than me. We played the same games. We fought for the same toys. Everything he was allowed to do, I got that as well. So I didn't see that uh, as a boy, he has any more advantage than me. I didn't see any difference. And we fought. Sometimes he lost and he cried. And sometimes I lost and I cried. And then you cry and then you fought again. So I really didn't see there's anything to be envied of as a boy. So uh, I think that is built the foundation on my view of equality for women. Uh, we had the same amount of pocket money from our parents. That was my first taste of equal pay. So I'm really happy about that. However, when I grow older, I realized that women did not get equality in the wider world. For example, when I graduated from a university, I'm from, uh, I'm from a engineering background. Uh, the male students got recruited very fast, even though their academic results were worse than mine, I have to say. So I realized that they refused to interview me simply because I'm a woman. And that is furious. Uh, I, was, uh, I feel really feel it is unjust. Then I saw feminism. Feminism tells my story. It tells me that women are denied all these opportunities simply because they are being a woman, not because they lack of any kind of ability at all. Feminism tells my story. That is how I became a feminist. I want to make the womanhood to be proud, make women to be proud of being women. I want to make us enjoy the joy of womanhood. I wanted it to be happy and glorious. Um, that's all my intention as a feminist. And for this National Women's Committee, what can I bring? I will bring two things. First, I will highlight the women's sex-based rights. Second, I will defend the freedom of speech. So why are say women's sex-based rights important? First of all, women's sex-based rights are protected in the Equality Act, which was brought in by the last Labour government in 2010. And also, the current Labour manifesto ensures single sex space of, ser of service providers. So it is already embedded in the Labour policy, I would say. We have plenty of ground to defend existing Labour policies. And uh, the reason for the single sex space is that if a woman, if a, if a person can claim to be a woman and enter women's single sex space, by that claim only, it will bring risks to women. We have seen this happening in women's prisons, in the domestic violence shelters, and hospital wards. We need to make sure that the Equality Act are correctly implemented at every level. We need to see that the next Labour government materialize its promises in the manifesto. So why women need a single sex basis? Some people say that because women are defenseless, we can defend ourselves, so we need this, this kind of isolated space. However, I disagree with that. We are not defenseless. We can defend ourselves. Single sex space itself is a self-defense mechanism. I get it from the art of war by Sun Tzu 2000 years ago from China. He said that to fight and win, it is good, but it is not the best. It is not supreme excellence. 
the supreme excellence of the art of war is to achieve the strategic goal without fighting, without getting into the fighting. So to translate that into the current situation is that single sex space is a strategic self-defense mechanism for women. We achieve our goal, which is to get on with life peacefully without having to risk physical confrontation. We don't want to get into the trouble in the first place. And a single sex space is such a mechanism. It is simply it is sensible. It is sensible to stop trouble from happening in the first place. That's why we need it. It is self-defense by self. Another reason for the sex-based rights is because the inequality women are subjected to is sex-based. Then our fight back must acknowledge that. As a class, women's inequality comes from men as a class want to control women's bodies. I would emphasize as bodies. Some of this control are blatant, like violence, People talking about senseless killing, but violent men are not senseless. They have their logic. Their logic is misogyny. They want women to be submissive and serve them. And when, when women refuse to do so, they become violent. Violence is a tool to intimidate women into submission, is to control women, control women's bodies. And some of those mechanisms are quite subtle like financial control, like social norms, like silencing. For example, the women's lower income is a strategy to keep women economically reliant on men. So without money, she cannot escape and a man can control the woman's body easily. And there are also things like state-backed violence, like abortion ban. This is, uh, the state-backed violence against women's body autonomy. And so as a society, we need to make it very clear that uh, women have our own ambitions in line. Men should not hold the wrong expectations. The idea that women can escape that control by a claim, a claim that you are now a man, not a woman anymore, it is useless. It's pretty shallow and superficial. Men's desire to control women's bodies doesn't change by your claim because the body doesn't change. Not that easily, not that quickly, not by surgeries at least. So what should we do if we cannot escape from our body? We cannot get out of our body. I would say we need to organize. The human society, it's highly complicated. The organization skills are far more important than physical strengths. So women need to organize. But politically, we need to prioritize women's needs. We should have no qualm to discuss women's rights. We should not feel ashamed of center women in political agenda. We need to create a world where that girls are encouraged to realize their own ambitions rather than being told they need to be supportive to others and play second fiddle. Being a woman is not a lifelong toil. It is fun, it is exciting. It is a journey. It has led to something really good. So the girls can have something to look forward to. Then, you know, otherwise they might be tempted, you know, they're tempted to identify out of womanhood if there is this false hope being given to them. So it is vital for the girls to feel that they are important. They are not the mean to reach other people's end. They themselves is a worthy end. And uh, the second thing I want to say that in the National Women's Committee, that uh, I would like to defend the freedom of beliefs and expressions, that I want to make sure women in the party can openly discuss our concerns. I would say that no ideology should be free from debate. We can criticize an ideology. It's a political debate. Any ideology should not be barred from debate. 
if any if there's an ideology we are not allowed to debate, then we are risking the freedom. We are risking the democracy as well. We need to be very vigilant of that. I want to make the Labour Party a welcoming place for women to discuss our rights. Women's rights are worthy of open discussions. Women should be free from bullying and harassment when we hold the debates. And I'm going to work with other members in the National Women's Committee to provide a platform to women to discuss our concerns and keep women's members well informed and in order to develop good quality, quality, policies and to make labor even more appealing to women voters. So just to summarize that um, I want to make womanhood happy and glorious. We want to make women be proud of ourselves. And to achieve that, I want the Labour Party to prioritize women's needs. And by defending the freedom of expression and speech, we are able to develop good policies for women's benefits. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tumen. That was really, really interesting and really helpful in setting out where you're coming from. Um, just before we move on to Louise, we've only got one, one question just now. So just to remind people and encourage you to post your questions there and hopefully you got some, uh, some thoughts from, from Tumen's um, summary there. Louise? Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, I'm going to just uh, read out what I've, I've prepared something um, so I don't miss anything I hope that's important. So I'm Louise Irvin and I'm asking you to nominate me for the National Women's Committee. Um, I'm job sharing the role of women's officer in my women's branch, which is Deptford, uh, Lewisham and Deptford CLP. I thought I'd just tell you a bit about myself. Um, I was born, grew up and trained as a doctor and GP in Scotland. My parents were both teachers. Once qualified, I spent two years working in Nicaragua, not long after the Sandinista revolution, funded by a charity called Scottish Medical Aid for Nicaragua that I helped set up. Later, I moved to London, where I worked as a GP in Deptford Lewisham for nearly 30 years. I've now retired, though I still do some locum and health promotion work. My husband is from India. I have two grown up children. I founded and still chair the Save Lewisham Hospital campaign, though we've recently changed our name to Lewisham Save Our NHS. I have a lot of family in Edinburgh, three siblings and a very elderly mother, so I visit elder Edinburgh a lot and I have many friends in Scotland whom I see regularly, and this helps me keep up to some extent with political developments in Scotland. As a lifelong socialist feminist, the fight for women's liberation and the fight for socialism have always been intertwined and I don't believe you can have one without the other. I've been involved in many community campaigns and always pushed for there to be a women's dimension to them. For example, I was on the panel set up by Lewisham Hospital at the behest of the Save Lewisham Hospital campaign to investigate its management of charges for refugees and asylum seekers including pregnant migrant women and sending bailiffs to them if they couldn't pay. Um, and the outcome of this panel led to significant improvements as acknowledged by the Lewisham Refugee and Migrant Network. I was also secretary of my UNITE branch for over a decade and we supported many women in struggle, in particular outsourced hospital domestic workers who are mainly women to support their industrial actions for better pay and conditions and to be brought back into the NHS. I also ensured there was a focus on the impact on women of the COVID pandemic in the People's COVID Inquiry into the government's handling of the pandemic that I helped organise as part of Keep Our NHS Public. Women are over half the population and not only do many general issues have a particular and disproportionate impact on women such as the COVID pandemic and the cost of living crisis or the deterioration of NHS services, but there are also many specific issues impacting directly on women as women, such as male violence, unequal pay, lack of affordable childcare, lack of provision for women's health problems, including poor maternity care. Women's and girls' issues are still neglected in society 
uh, there's still a long way to go. And for example, just today, I saw a shocking report by published by a women and girls charity called Rosa, which showed that less than 2% of the grant money coming into the country's charity sector has been given to women's sector services. And this echoes um, a similar report from a couple of years ago by the Women's Resource Centre, showing that, that, that less than 3% of London grants went into the women and girls sector. These findings, which show that a pathetic slice of the pie is going to 50% of the population, are staggering, especially when, according to research, such as the Women's Budget Group, um, women and girls are at the sharp end of poverty during the cost of living crisis. We still don't have equal pay and have made little progress in ending violence against women and girls with rape convictions so low it has been effectively decriminalized. So there's still inequality and oppression. And if we look around the world, such as in Iran and Afghanistan, we see how dreadful things are there for women. These are women that our women's movement in the UK, including the Labour Party, could help. The Labour movement has a proud history of championing women's rights and achieving great changes, yet there's a residue of misogyny in the Labour movement that still sometimes marginalises women's issues, seeing them as secondary, a deviation, a distraction. I've heard all these things recently. Um, Labour members, especially women members, must campaign for these policies and for Labour to take women and our issues seriously. Positive change can only come about if two conditions are satisfied, in my opinion, that we should have women's organisations pushing for change from below and a government committed to legislative change for the benefit of women. And this requires grassroots organising by women in the Labour Party, as well as leadership and support for women members. I believe I could bring my experience as chair of the Save Lewisham Hospital campaign to help strengthen and develop women's organisation within the Labour Party, as I've learned so much about connecting with, supporting and involving people in struggles for change. A priority for the National Women's Committee must be to support the formation and the work of the women's branches. I see women's branches as the vital backbone of women's organisation in the Labour Party. In addition, we need a strong, dynamic and authoritative annual women's conference that can have a real influence on Labour policy and practice. The National Women's Committee must ensure that the ideas and energy of the women's organisation are directed both outwards into wider society and also inwards, supporting the women's branches and also ensuring the women that Labour leadership takes women's issues seriously and acts on them. I'm supported by Labour Women's Declaration. We believe women and girls are subject to discrimination and oppression on the basis of our sex and that women have the right to sex-based protections as set out in the Equality Act 2010, which Labour introduced. Labour has stated it supports the exemptions in the Equality Act, allowing women single sex spaces. Several Labour politicians in the past few weeks have spoken in public in support of women's sex based rights, including Yvette Cooper, Steve Reed, Annalise Dodd, Siobhan McDonough, and David Blunkett. They're clear that biological sex and gender identity are two diff entirely different notions a crucial distinction to make if these issues are to be properly discussed and the rights of all oppressed groups respected. We support the rights of trans-identified people, but where there's an important apparent clash with women's rights, um, for example, around access to single sex spaces, it's important that we can have respectful and tolerant discussions about these issues so that we can resolve them. I'd hope I would be, would be able to facilitate that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louise, for another really interesting um, appraisal of where you're coming from and where, why you're standing. Um, before we go on to the Q&A, and we've got three questions just now, and I had a quick look at them, and they all look like great questions, and they're quite, um, quite different, so I think we'll probably go through those. Um, just a reminder to those who might have joined a bit late, it's in the chat that we are recording and no um, private data is going to be shared from this call. Um, the chat functions off, the Q&A is where to post your questions, hopefully we'll get a few more and just a quick time check as well that it's 26 minutes past two so we've still got a good 35 minutes for going through questions. So I'm just going to press ahead with the first question. And I'm going to put it to Louise first, and we're going to go turn and turn about. Um, so, for Louise, 
this is from Gina. A judge in Scotland has recently found that the term woman in the Equality Act includes a man with a gender recognition, I think it means certificate, um, saying that he's legally a woman. What do you think of this and what do you intend to do about it? Thank you. It's a very good question. Yes, um, we know that the uh, Equality and Human Rights Committee is supporting the idea that there should be clarification of the meaning of sex in the Equality Act. I honestly never thought that one would have to do that because the Equality Act actually says um, a woman is a female of any age and a man is a male of any age. But given the findings of that um, Scottish judgment, that has now been called into question. So it's important that it is clarified as meaning biological sex, which is I believe what it was always intended to mean. And my understanding is also that Keir Starmer and other members of the, 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 the shadow front bench are, are in agreement with that. Obviously, we what do I tend to do about it? We There is a movement wider than us, wider than our um, Labour Women's Declaration uh, that to, to, to press for that. And there's going to be a debate in Parliament on this issue um, quite soon. And um, I think what the main thing is to publicise these initiatives and to keep up the pressure on the Labour Party, the Labour shad the, the Shadow Front Bench to, to stay good to their, be true to their statement that they support that. And Jumin, do you have follow up? Do you have an answer as yeah. well? Uh, I, I want to add a little bit uh, about uh, the what a judge says that uh, uh, a woman in the Equality Act into a man will include a man with Gender Recognition Act. What judge says that uh, it is a legal definition. We, 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 I would like to remind people of the idea of a legal definition, legal fiction. Legal definition and le often in the um, uh, law society, in law world, is called a legal fiction. It should be applied as such a law, but it only has its, uh, it has a limited use within the law system. It doesn't dictate people's vocabulary outside of that law system. So a judge can decide that, that, you know, that's a judge, or what judges say. And uh, however, it doesn't dictate in everyday languages uh, that you have to follow somebody's uh, gender recognition certificate because you don't even know whether a person hold one or not. Um, so the, what judges say only apply to the legal system. Um, I want to take an example to explain a bit the, the idea of legal fiction. Mm. For example, like uh, in the English law, if somebody disappeared for seven years and nobody can see, that person can be legally declared the death, right? You get a death certificate. So the, the, the house can be inherited or this legal procedure can go along. But nobody would say that. But just because a person has been given a legal death certificate, then we have to say that person died, you know, seven years on this precise day when they got the certificate. No, when a biology, um, biology is written, we can say somebody disappeared since a certain date and have never been found again. And it is perfectly fine to say so. But we need to differentiate the legal definition, legal fiction, from the everyday use of everyday language. So I would say that when a judge says the term woman in the Equality Act include a man with a gender recognition certificate, it should not interfere our language use in the wider society without, without the involvement in the legal system. Thank you. Thanks, Jumin. Um there has been a, a, a comment related to that question and the answers given, I think. Um, so I think I'll just add, ask this one just now. Mm -hmm. uh, my Labour MP has been very careful not to commit either way as to whether the term woman is a biological label or a legal fiction. How can you be confident that Labour will stand up for women's sex based rights? That came through um, anonymously, but I think it's picking up on this this debate. So Jumin, I don't know if you want to follow up on that first, please. Uh, yes, uh, uh, yes, um, uh, that is uh, the reason why we stand for these positions, because we have this worry for the whole Labour Party as well. 
we feel that uh, you know the women's needs are not prioritized. The women's rights are not really securely protected. So I hope that our campaign itself can persuade with, you know, lots of uh, members in the party that we have this group of women fighting for women's rights. And in the case, you know, hopefully if we are elected and uh, as a women's uh, committee member, we should be able to persuade the MPs and other la labor members to prioritize women's needs. Louise. Yeah, I, I would um, concur with Juman. I mean, I, I, I'm not totally confident or confident. It's only with pressure that we can actually get any, any guarantee. There's no guarantees. There's never any guarantees anyway in politics. You, you have to be organized. You have to maintain your pressure and you have to fight. And sometimes for a very long time, even the changes that we've seen, the slight shifts we've seen in the sort of statements that you're getting from the shadow front bench have come as a result of probably, I would say now several years of organizing and pressure and we have to keep the pressure up. So yeah, I think we can achieve it. I think women are strong. Women have, you know, just, you know, realized how much risk our rights are at and what what what's at stake um and we've got to keep on going hard at it i think thank you so much right i'm going to go to the next question from norma great to have such able candidates i would like to ask what steps louise and juman would take to strengthen the ability of labor women's declaration to influence party members and elected representatives so we'll jump back to Juman. Okay. Um, I, I think for the LWD to influence party members as, as well as elected reps, uh, at least I think the campaign we are running now, uh, the message goes out to the members, LWD's signatories that uh, LWD's um, audacious enough to put two candidates openly, uh, openly support women's uh, sex-based rights for the National Women's Committee. That shows strength, uh, that is spread the message. I hope that we you know, can keep the pressure on and uh, spread the message. E eventually we are able to ignite more debates within the party and more debates, I firmly believe, will be benefit to women. And in that way, we can influence elected representatives of labor. And please, if there's anything from you. I think something, there's something in the, in the question about um, somebody, I think maybe Kerry or somebody can answer this question in more detail. Because they are actually, you know, I, I mean, I, I suppose I just agree with what Juven said. You know, Labour Women's Declarations are very important organisations, very important group of women. Actually, definitely needs more people to join it and get involved in it and be more active because it is hard work. Um, so to strengthen our ability to influence party members is to have more people involved, <laughs> sharing the workload and um, getting on with things. Um, in terms of influencing more widely, I think for me, what I said earlier, I think we need we need to have a structure of really strong women's branches in the Labour Party. Um, and I've been hearing that in some places, it, women have been discouraged from setting up their women's branches. And I think that is very wrong. And one of the things we can be doing is to try to support and encourage women to set up women's branches, because it's only through the organization, self-organization of women in all the different areas in the country that we're going to be able to build this kind of strength of movement we're going to need in order to affect the change we need. Thank you so much. Um, OK, I'm going to move on to the next question. And um, Kerry is saying she is happy to speak. So we'll maybe call on Kerry towards the end, but, but try to get through a few of the questions just now. But yeah, it would be good to hear from Kerry on LWD influencing as well. Uh, so from Laura, how can we best support our sisters in the party who agree with the need to protect single sex spaces, et cetera, but are too scared or don't want to cause trouble um, to have the courage 
to speak out. So, um, Louise, can we go back to you, please? Thank you. I think this is a very important question. I think, you know, we know that a lot of women in the party have been bullied and abused uh, for, for even making the most, asking the most minor questions, um, trying to raise uh, motions at, at their meetings, at their branches, etc. And it's been really hard for them. It is possible that it's slightly less hard now because I think that, you know, that things have shifted a bit and it, it's, perhaps a bit more possible to speak out. I think one of the roles, not just of the Labour Women's Declaration, but the wider organ organising women within the party is to support each other. If you're not, if you think you're the only one that thinks what you think, or the, the only one that speaks out, then it is scary and you feel isolated. But if you think you're one of many, then you get courage from that. I think, and also the more, the more you see other women speaking out and seeing that they do, you know, they, they, they do manage to survive and they can fight, you know, fight back, then that gives you courage too. So, um, yeah, I think it's hard, but we must be, we support each other and I think then we can do more. Hey, Jim, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I want to just use the quote from subject, uh, suffragettes that uh, courage in courage brings courage. Courage brings courage is everywhere. So we, we, we need to organize. So more we say, we bring, encourage more women to say even more. And in that way, we build the momentum, build the movement to eventually to change the whole climate. Thank you so much. We've got plenty of questions coming in, so I'm gonna gonna keep moving. And one for Louise just now. Are you connected to Can SG? You might want to say something on that. Yeah, I'm a member of the it's the Clinical Advisory Network on Sex and Gender, which is a group of about um, nearly a hundred now um, clinicians across all specialties with, that are concerned about the impact or the effects of sex and gender in medicine. It's an apolitical group. We've actually got members from across the entire political spectrum and in my role in the group i i'm non-political i'm not I, you know i'm not pushing any politics like politics with a big with a capital p so i i do try to keep those two hats sort of separate if you can imagine wearing two hats at the same time um that's me yeah um i'm gonna read the next question out and go to juman first um it, it i'm skipping a few and we'll come back to the others if we can but this one's quite uh, a bit bit different from the ones that you've been answering so far. Um, it's about the Women's Committee, it's from Anne. Previous GC Women's Committee members have been challenged in various ways by other committee members, which diminishes any potential impact the Women's Committee could make due to the committee only having four two-hour meetings a year. How will our candidates be, uh, handle this likely resistance? So Juman, I don't know if you can pick off the answers to that. Uh... I think that is, uh, I will need to see that if I'm elected, which kind of challenges come. I have seen that the previous uh, GC members uh, have, uh, you know, uh, I even see them being expelled, for example, for on the other excuses. Uh, one is uh, we certainly need to be very cautious of everything we say that um, we need to find um, the diplomatic and a political way to say things so we don't get into other, you know, the party politics as possible. And uh, we kind of uh, constantly stay in the line that we prioritize women's needs. We prioritize, we focus on the women. So uh, I feel that is the way. Another thing is, uh, uh, I know that the National Women's Committee, um, as a woman's officer, I, I didn't get any communication communication from the National Women's Committee. So I don't even know what they are doing and after the conference, what they decide. So if I am elected, I would like to um, bring frequent feedback. Like, uh, you know, I, I will have uh, my email open and the people can email me anytime and I can ask those questions uh, if, at the National Women's Committee meetings and I will give feedback. It will be like a regular newsletter 
when the National Women's Committee meeting happens, I will write what we have discussed and what we have decided. Uh, I hope that will give uh, the women in labor a more sense of what National Women's Committee is doing. And um, if possible, I would also like to build a network of the women's officers across the party so the women are better organized. So that's my focus, my focus on women and my focus on women being organized in the party. Thank you. Thanks, Louise. I think what Jim has said is absolutely right. I mean, I'm not necessarily thinking that we would be going in all guns blazing, discussing, trying to push gender critical policies uh, at all or ideas at all. Uh, they will have their place and they will, we will try to bring them up as and when necessary. The important thing is to build a strong women's movement, a strong organization in the Labour Party, because that will do the work that will achieve so much more. And that will also have influence on the National Women's Committee, especially as Juman says, if we can open up dialogue between the National Women's Committee and the women mem women's members and the women's branches. And also, um, I may be wrong, but in, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that, that in the past, the gender critical women on the committee hadn't been elected in an, as such. I mean, we, we are, we'll, we're openly endorsed by Labour Women's Declaration if we're elected onto the committee, we will at least have the kind of um, confidence that comes from knowing that we actually have a, 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 an electorate, a base within the party that, that wants us to do uh, certain things and speak, say certain things. And I think the other thing is to be courageous as well, just to, to, you know, in a reasonable way and in a way that doesn't engender, you know, toxic you know, uh, reactions, but just start to try to open up the dialogue about some of the issues that we've talked about um, and hope that other women on the committee recognize the importance of these issues, especially as we're seeing Labour to some extent struggling <laughs> over what it says about some of the issues to do with women. But um, yeah, I think we can only try um, our very best and it, it, I would not want to underestimate the, the, the struggle. Thank you. And anything from you to men on that? I think we heard from I you. Already done it. <laughs> you are going backwards and forwards now. Yeah. Right. So the next one will go to Louise first. And just before I ask you the next question, Louise, just to say there is a um, there's a question. Oh, it may have disappeared actually. So it might have been dealt with via um, tech. So that's fine. OK. Um, Louise, what are the next steps in a practical sense to protect the rights of biological women in the context of very strong trans activism? I mean, I think that no one group or individual can do this by themselves. I'm very much aware that we are part of a movement, a wider movement. Um, with, there's a whole list of, of, of really good women, women's organizations, like such as Sex Matters, but many others, um, Transgender Trend, um, Lesbian Labour, uh, um, many others who are making the arguments and making the case for women's sex-based rights for biological sex. So we just have to be part of that movement, which we are already, and we have to just make sure that we help each other, support each other, and keep on pushing. It's it's kind of an open door because, in a way, as the majority of people in the country think that way, whether they're Labour or Tory supporters or you know undecided. And we saw that even you know in Scotland, the majority of people actually do not think that biological men should be in women's prisons. So you know we we. we we've got, I think, right on our side. We've got logic on our side, reason on our side, science on our side. And we should be able to, for again, going back to it, we have to be organized and we have to network and we have to keep on pushing. Thanks, Louise and Chibin. Uh, I totally agree with Louise that, uh, you know, the reality is on our side. That's the most important thing I, I, I want to rely on. It is, uh, you know, the reality, the, the, the human cognitions on our side. That is why I'm really confident about our fight. And on a practical sense, to protect, uh, protect the rights of biological women, 
I would say is uh, to uphold the existing laws, uphold the Equality Act, so uphold the Labour's manifesto, which promised single sex space for women. So we hold those policy first. Then we open, we encourage freedom of speech. I won't encourage other women in the party to say their opinions about these policies and to debate other, the, other laws that they may see that infringe women's rights, for example. And that eventually we will form a more woman-centered opinion inside of the party. That is how we are able to fight against that uh, transgender ideologies and activisms within the party. That's quite a nice segue into one of the next questions. And just timing wise, so the candidates are aware, we're at um, 40, 40, 1447. So we need to rattle through a few more um, to, to get as many of these absolutely brilliant questions covered. Um, and there's two in particular that I think would be quite good. So one is on um, the trans rights activism point. So the question, and it's going to go to Jim in first this time, if you're asked what a Labour government should do to protect trans people's rights, dignity and safety, what would you say? Is it enough to say that your concern is with women's rights only and the rights of trans people is for others to advocate? Or do you think it's important to demonstrate that Labour Women's Declaration is not anti-trans or insensitive to their issues? Sorry, go for it, Jim. Okay. Uh... There are kind of the, uh, I have two things I want to say. One is from feminism point of view. Feminism should not be ashamed or have any qualm to put women first, prioritize women's need first. And then in the Labour Party or Labour Women's Declaration, we should care for all. And uh, so in the Labour Party, I would say that um, we care, we protect uh, trans people's rights as well. We protected their dignity, we protected their safety. And uh, that is the, what I said before, the current transgender ideology doesn't protect trans people's rights either. Think about the, the trans umbrella. It put everything, you know, the, uh, the male to female, trans, the transgender, the female to male, the non-binary, and there are also a full spectrum of different degrees of transition in it. And the plus, it put in those cross-dressing uh, people under that trans umbrella as well, to put so many different category of people under the name of trans that really damages those, the, 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 the trans people who genuinely want to live their right, they want to live their life peacefully. So um, we need to debate, have a genuine debate about how to protect trans people's rights. I feel that as a Labour Party, we care for all, we care for trans people, absolutely. And the Labour Women's Declaration is definitely not anti-trans. We care about trans people as well. And the one thing I particularly want to point out is currently there are lots of trans people. They are young women. They are. They feel that they are so oppressed that uh, they they fear of the womanhood is some sort of the mockery, um, something not to look forward to, something kind of the dreadful. So they, they want to identify out of womanhood, and that is definitely a woman's issue. You know, we want to make sure that their things are prioritized. They are so important and that they don't need to identify out of womanhood to realize their ambitions. So, you know, so we protect the trans thank people. Thank you. Thanks, Chumin. Louise? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I agree with Chumin. I think it is important that we, we demonstrate that Labour Women's Declaration is not anti-trans or insensitive to their needs. However, that is not the same as saying that we are a, a, like a broad movement for everybody's rights. We are a women's rights movement because we actually think women's rights are under threat in, in, in all kinds of ways. So we are advocating for women's rights. Within that, we of course want to be open for dialogue 
and where, as I said earlier, where there's a, an apparent clash of rights, it, and the, it may be more apparent than real because there's been such a polarization and so little actually, the, you know, there was that mantra, no debate, we're not allowed to debate this, any debate is transphobic. There's been so little discussion that we've not been able to even begin to move towards a resolution of this apparent conflict. I, I believe that resolution is possible. So I'm all for talking and discussing, but at the same time, there's the starting point for us is, of course, women's rights are our primary purpose. Um, that's why we, we exist doesn't mean we're against anybody else's rights and we feel that there should be ways of um, making them compatible. Thank you so much Louise. Um, I'm going to get another question and before I do that there is a, it's more like a comment I think so I'll just I'll just read this out because I think it's quite a helpful um, point. How can Labour women women's declaration members share good news from CLPs with each other. Could someone vet what is confidential information or write it up appropriately? It would help with the courage that Juman talked about earlier. I think that if you, if you want to answer that or if you've got an idea, that, that's fine. Maybe, maybe you can give the answer. But I also wanted to make sure that we get um, another question in. And we are getting to towards the end of the time we've got so I'm going to kind of squish two together if that's right it seems that younger women and men don't see the reality of sex in the same way as say the 35 plus population do the candidates have any ideas of how to explain our concerns to that particular population I thought that was quite an interesting question we're going to Louise on this question first so if you want to answer the other point about um sharing with CLPs that's fine yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I was recently involved in helping to put up a, an exhibition in Aberdeen on the women's the history of the women's liberation movement in Aberdeen in the late 70s and early 80s. It was wonderful. We had all the different artifacts and photo, posters and newsletters, everything that we did then. And that was, you know, we were mainly young women who were very um, agitated and motivated by, by feminist ideas. And that seems that movement died away for whatever reason. Um, I, th I think that the older generation of women have to reconnect with younger women. I think it's really sad that there seems to have been an even bigger gulf than ever before. There's a lot, an awful lot of anti-age ageism and misogyny against older women. I think the book Hags, which I haven't read yet, but I'm going to, talks about that. And I think some younger women are afraid to be seen talking to us because, uh, for various reasons. I think we do need to reach out to younger women. I noticed at the Philia conference last year, there were a lot more younger women than I had um, ever seen before. Um, so I think, uh, and I know there are, there are some feminist groups in some universities now who have had the courage to, you know, um, do things like ha have meetings about women's issues. So I think it's happening slowly, but we must make sure we're always open to those conversations with younger women. And just for your benefit for the candidates, Kerry's really helpfully posted in the chat, which everyone should be able to see um, a response on the sharing good news on CLPs. So Juman, if you want to go yeah. ahead on the relation. Yeah, uh, I think the younger women and men don't see the reality of sex in the same way that we say, you know, 35 plus. Uh, I feel that it's very much related to the uh, education system change. So the education institutions, universities, the secondary schools probably changed their policies, changed their curriculum, the EDI, equality, diversity, inclusion training from more than 10 years ago before we sort of noticed. They secretly change those ideas of the men and women before we notice that is how we get a whole new generation that don't think that uh, it's biological sex, don't feel that biological sex is such an important thing, such an important definition, and we can't lose it. So I think the way to fight back is uh, uh, we need to change the education system, like. Um, um, other organization like a women's rights network is doing to collect that uh, relationship, sex and relationship education from the secondary schools to see what is actually taught to our children. And, uh, and that examination need to go on in university as well. So what kind of EDI training they are providing to other big organizations so what kind of relationship they have with 
and some lobbyist groups, what kind of uh, propaganda material they have been received. So that is, uh, you know, to find the route. And I also know other women's organizations like Sex Matters, they are pushing out the, the reality-based uh, training program for the uh, sex and the relationship education. I think that definitely the right direction to go, that we need to, to really focus on secondary and the university education to really change the next, next generation of people. Thank you so much. There's another anonymous question that looks like a really good one. We've got three minutes, so I'm going to put it out really quick. This has been a very helpful session. Two great candidates, a purely practical question. The reality is the majority of CLPs tend to support slates. How are you planning to get around that? Do we know how other candidates on slates stand on this issue? Um, and so, yeah, if we we're could. trying to find out how other candidates stand on this issue. Uh, so far, we're not aware that there are any other um, what you maybe there's one yes there's one other gender critical candidate I think her name is Cecile Wright on one of the slates the grassroots labour slate but we're not aware of the others I mean frankly the, the it's a problem the, the slates I think the slate system is awful um, but it's the way it is for them to just nominate two candidates then they have to then choose only four out of the six of this of their preferred slate to nominate and that probably is a disadvantage we've already heard there's a, one branch that just, they, although they sympathise with us, they because they wanted to nominate a whole slate, they just went ahead and nominated the whole slate. slate. Um, we, we didn't really have enough candidates for Labour Women's Declaration to have a slate. Um, I don't think we were really sure we wanted that. We thought it might be quite good to give people a choice so they could they could vote for us, nominate us two, and then they could make a choice of others that they wanted to, to nominate. I think it's, a, it's an open discussion for next year about how we, how we do this. I don't think I've got an answer to it. And anything from you, Tumin? Um, yeah, but we we so we are for two people only, but we are slate as well, right? <laughs> so uh, I think it's uh, quite a lot of uh, CLPs that tend to support the slates, not because they want to support the slates itself, but simply because those uh, organization or the the providers of slates are more familiar with. Uh, and they are better connected. They are more familiar with the whole, you know, organization where they come from. So that's why they support those slates. Um, so I feel that if we just campaign harder this time, if we don't win, we try even harder next time. We will become a familiar source, trustworthy source. And uh, as a slate, we may have more women to get on board, and they may support our slate as well, right? Thanks, Tumin. Um, it's one minute to three, and I really want to um, remind everyone that the document is in the chat, which takes you to um, how to nominate, because uh, we think there's maybe been a bit of confusion. Um, so to clarify that you can nominate the candidates for the National Women's Committee, you can nominate at your women's branch or CLP, you can ask your CLP secretary or women's officer if your CLP has a different procedure, the deadline for CLPs to submit nominations is the tw is 12 noon on Friday, the 23rd of June, 2023. And details can be found on the Labour Party website. And then secondly, please stand as a delegate to Women's Conference if you're a woman. Each CLP can elect up to two delegates to the Women's Conference. If a second delegate is sent, one delegate should be a disabled BAME or LGBT plus woman. If you're a woman, put yourself forward as a delegate of your CLP and encourage other women who may support us to stand. Your CLP secretary or women's officer should already have got an email about delegate registration and the deadline to register delegates is also 12 noon, Friday the 23rd of June, 2023.